Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Rev. Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study. Well, praise the Lord and good evening tonight. Thank you for joining in this powerful study. I need to apologize. We are in a series in the book of Ephesians, this powerful book. But there was a interruption or a break last week because um, there was a death in the family and some things came about. But there was a powerful word on a nice Bible study. But I need you to know we're picking up part four of chapter one in this series, You Can Live Above It All. So I need you to understand that this is a series on the book of Ephesians, and I've been tackling each kind of verse by verse, expositing the text, and it'll help you understand the Bible. That's what word up means. Let's, let's get the real meaning of the word so that we can understand what we have in Christ. And so um, this is part four, which is going to cover the end of chapter 1. So, if you would go with me to verse 15, uh, grab your Bibles. Um, well, we'll go to verse 14. We're going to pick up today in verse 14. Alright? I'm reading from the King James Version, the book of Ephesians, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession of unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love unto all the saints, cease not to give, to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, um, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling? What is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he hath put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. What a powerful word. We're picking up in this verse in the book of Ephesians. I talked to you earlier as we have looked at this book because it culminates in giving us an understanding of all the power we have as believers. And I shared with you, we're living in a time now, heightened spiritual warfare. We're living in a time now, you should not be shocked by anything you're going through. But the word that Paul gave to the church at Ephesus, after me giving you that background, go look at uh, parts 1, 2, and 3, you'll find out that this church was a tremendous church spiritually, but they also have been to the point that they were not exercising who they are. So much so that the Apostle John, when talking to the seven churches of Revelation, remember the catchphrase or the word he gave to the church at Ephesus, you lost your first love. Believers, I'm telling you, don't let anything take away your understanding of your identity and your power in Christ. If, if you're falling uh, down, if you're going through something, if the enemy has got you, it's because you forgot who you are. We have a mighty, mighty power. I need you to transcend this side of heaven. Get your mind into understanding what God thought about when he redeemed us and brought us back and gave us uh, the power that we need to survive. Now, what's great about where we're picking up at, and I'm going to jump right in because you know, because I get started on this and it's just exciting to me, is I want you to look at verse 14 where we started. And I want you to see the words and I want you to understand what Paul had on his mind when he was saying that. Um, 
Well, you know what? In order to do this, let's go to verse 11, because it reads right into that. I won't be there long. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, predestinated, according to the purpose of him who had worked all things after the counsel of his will. So we need to understand is that we have an inheritance. You need that inheritance. A lot of us mentally ascend to all of the Bible jargon, all the stuff people say, you know, we got power to do this. We all ascend to it, but few of us live it. But you need to understand it's an inheritance. Jesus died so we could inherit the things he died for us to have. It's been predestinated, meaning there's some things in your life that's going to come because God predestined them to come. Did you know that everything that you need, God has already placed available to you? Everything you are going to go through, God is not shocked by you going through it. Here's what I want to tell you, and this is where you'll anchor in. You have enough power to handle anything you've been given Anything you go through, anything the enemy tries, somebody ought to say with me, I have enough power to handle this. God's done his part. All you have to do is your part. Say it again. I have enough power to handle this. I have enough power to handle any situation that comes in my life. Why? Because this text is very clear. We have obtained an inheritance. When? When we received him as our Lord and Savior. And this inheritance is in Christ. That is the power of this book. The book of Ephesians utilizes the term in Christ 27 times. The reason I say you can handle everything, help me Holy Ghost, is because it's not your power that you're using. It is God's power because you have been given an inheritance in Christ. In Christ is a biblical statement. And you need to understand it because a lot of people use it out of context. In Christ means that every bit of my strength, every bit of my hope, every bit of my desires, every bit of my ability is in Christ. It's not mine. It's not me that's doing it. It's Christ. All I have to do is line up with the word, stay strong in the word, and remember that my life is hid in Christ because I obtain an inheritance. What does it mean to be in Christ? Several things I want to tell you about it. In Christ means that I identify with Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, right? Death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. I identify that everything he did, he then gave back to me, right? That's what being in Christ means. We get the benefits of, what, of everything Christ did. We get the benefits of healing, the benefits of peace, the benefits of hope, the benefits of of resources, the benefits of a uh, good night's sleep, the benefit of smiling in the midst of trials, the benefit of knowing that I can handle this because the greatest thing in my life is Christ. I tell people all the time, I got a nice job, I got, uh, you know, God gave me a nice house, nice car, beautiful wife that loves me, some kids, all my kids are okay. And the thing that I say, people say, well, that's why your life's okay. No. The reason my life is okay, the reason my life is blessed, the reason I make it is because I'm in Christ. Let me give you some words of in Christ. In Christ, uh, what did Christ do? Colossians 2.15. You write that down. It says, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. That's where our power comes from. You get the picture. Jesus went down from the cross, went down to the grave. He destroyed death, hell, and the grave. And then in Colossians, it tells us that he spoiled in the King James. I want you to see that word. Having spoiled principalities and power. Principalities are the dominions and um, the different sections or hierarchies of demons in hell. Powers, part of that hierarchy. He destroyed all of that. He destroyed everything that had us in bondage. And then he made a show of them openly. Meaning that this was not done in secret. Jesus defeated the devil. The devil knows he's defeated. He tries to keep from us to know that he's defeated. But that's what we rely on to keep our faith strong. Okay? In Christ, I have an inheritance. 
Why? Because in Christ is where all the benefits are. Jesus gave me. And so when I'm in Christ, it's because I now have a victory that he already won. Remember, Colossians 2.15, listen to it in the Living Bible Translation. And blot it out, starting at 14, and blot it out, the charges proved against you, the list of his commandments, which you had not obeyed. He took this list of sins and destroyed it by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he took away Satan's power, verse 15, to accuse you of sin, God openly displayed to the whole world Christ's triumph at the cross where your sin will be taken away. The reason you have power in Christ is because he openly destroyed Satan. He went down. All the things Satan had against us were all blotted out when Jesus died on the cross. He now looks at us and because of that death, burial, resurrection, and we've been redeemed, now we have the victory that Christ won and everything and all the benefits he won in victory. Hebrews 2.14 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing that through the death he might destroy the one who had the power of death. So Hebrews 2.14, come on. What I'm telling you is, you already are working from a position of victory. Somebody say, I already have victory. That's how God blesses us. And every one of these verses in Ephesians, um, in this first chapter, gives us the victory that God wanted us to have. How did he do it? He spoiled principalities and power. He gave us this because of his, here's something that will help somebody tonight. God loves you unconditionally. He loves you with an unbreakable love. Can I help you? Nothing you have done, will do, nothing you're doing right now could separate you from the love of God. Romans 8, 29. I mean, Romans 8, 29 tells us that. We'll look at, we'll look at Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced, I want to get the Living Bible translation, that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't. Life can't. Angels can't. All the powers of hell cannot keep me from God's love. So the blessing of being in Christ and having what I have right now, right now, I feel somebody feeling this victory. The blessing is it's because God loves me uncontrolled. It's, it's a love that I can't even describe. John 10, 28 says, and nothing can pluck me out of his hand. Do you realize that nothing can separate us from the love of God? Nothing can pluck us out of God's hands. And because nothing can pluck, a, pluck us out of God's hands, you are safe and secure in Christ. That is the teaching we're teaching. You can live above it all. So I said, how do I go through it? You hang on and believe in the power that God has. Go to the next verse with me. Look at verse 12. We start at verse 11. Look at verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. To God be the glory for the great things that he has done. Here is the blessing in that text. We should be to the praise of his glory. Let's, let's look at that. First of all, how I survive is by my praise. Praise is when I lift God up, honor God because of who he is. When you begin to praise God, you cannot stay down and praise. Many of us forget, we think praise is for worship services in church, but the best worship time you can have is by yourself. I challenge you. Sometimes I just go off into praise just to make sure that the darkness and the demons around me know that I'm still attached in my mind to this same God who delivered me. I don't just praise God when something good happens. I praise God because something good always happens because He is my Savior. Do you get that? Some of us say, oh, I really got to praise God. You want to hear what God did? No. 
The praise should be based upon the foundation of who you are in Christ. All the protection he's done. All the things he's delivered you from. All the days and nights he kept you because of who he is. The times he sent angels watching over you because he wanted to bless you. Many nights you shouldn't have made it, but God sent an angel to keep you. Many times you should have went under. So if you want to know why I praise God, I don't praise him for what he shall do or just what's happening at the moment, I praise him for who I am. Somebody listen to me right now. You can shake off every dark problem in your life, every uh, dark impulse. You could walk around with a different smile. You could start believing in miracles again. You could rise up out of wherever you are if you just believe this word in verse 12 where it says, if I ever learn to be a praiser. Praise Him to get deliverance. You can praise Him in your kitchen and praise Him as you're going down the, the road in your car. Praise Him. And if you make praise, it says we should be to the praise of His Lord. Once we praise Him, we bring God glory. When God's glory comes, deliverance comes. Praise brings the glory down. That's your kind of glory they're talking about in church services. It doesn't just happen in church. You can bring glory in your situation as to where you are right now. Look at verse 13. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, who also after that you believe you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit is in us. Holy Spirit has nothing to do, uh, I, and I talked about this, and I'm coming up to where we were. I told you before, don't listen to folk who tell you the only sign of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. That's not true. There is, there's many uh, examples speaking in tongues where it demonstrates the Holy Ghost. But the Bible tells us as soon as we are in Christ, remember, there is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Christ, Jesus Christ, once I got in Christ, I, I got the anointing or the sealing of the Holy Spirit. It says I, I was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It is God's mark in my life to say I'm, I've made it. So I said, how do I know the Holy Spirit is there? Because you changed. Think about the things you used to do, the things you used to want to do, the things. I know you're still fighting. All of us are still fighting some habits and still fighting some struggles. But when you get up in the morning and you start thinking about who you are, the Holy Spirit or the anointing of God is always inside speaking to your heart, letting you know that you belong to Christ. The Holy Ghost is always with you. We call it the Holy Ghost, the, the Spirit of God, that power of God that's in us. And it is what God sent to seal us after we heard the word of truth. Hmm. After I heard the word of truth, not after I spoke in tongues. Nothing wrong with speaking in tongues. But don't try to make signs uh, take away from you something that has been given to you or biblically legislated by the word of God. The word says, I have the Holy Ghost ready to fight my battles, ready to lead, ready to guide, ready to direct, ready to assist. All I have to do is call and that spirit will come on me. Verse 14 said, that Holy Ghost is the earnest. That word earnest means it's just a, um, a, a down payment, a deposit. It's just a glimpse of what real glory is going to look like. Can you imagine? We don't know what's going to happen in glory, but what we get down here, our best day is not going to be good as what's in heaven. I don't know what's in heaven, but I do know that Jesus told the thief on the cross, the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. I do know in heaven any description that we had. There's no words that can transfix our mind to understand the deepness of heaven. If the Holy Ghost is just a deposit with some of the experiences I've had in the Holy Spirit, with the tears with my heart full of warmth and love and joy, if that's just a down payment, I can't imagine what's going to be in glory. All I'm telling you is you have the Holy Spirit now, but it's just a deposit. It opens up areas to bless us. Then it says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of all saints, cease not to give mention of you in my prayers. Watch this. Cease not to give thanks for you and make mention of you in my prayers. I love this. We're talking about power. Some of the most defeated saints are the ones who can't get away. 
get along with other people. You, you got this contrary spirit. You, you got this um, so what. Um, it, it's a spirit that cannot reach out and touch other people. Uh, it's a spirit that is constantly focused on you. And when you do that, you twist the love of God. The very, the, this is where this text divides. This is where we pick up the, 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 prayer, the prayer. Remember I told you the first one is the doctrinal understanding. But now the prayer goes in the deeper doctrine. But Paul is praying this doctrine. So he, he said, all of you have just received all the benefits I just talked about. He said, now, everything, every time I think about you, I can't cease but give thanks for you. Right now, your deliverance may depend on you being able to love, care about, and thank somebody else. Many of us get caught up in, the, in today's society tell us, oh, just, just, we keep reaching, reaching more, 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 more. And God is saying, yeah, but have you just given thanks to the people around you? Have you prayed for other people so that you can you know, so you can really be a child of God. Paul said, I cease not to give thanks for you. He said, when I heard about your conversion, I thank God. What do I thank God for other people for? Because other people, when I look at them, I have a kindred spirit. I, I have someone else who I know I can say, God is good, and they'll say they understand. I can look, you know, I can see some people, you know, they're different. Um, I was riding a train, and I got to write this gentleman back. My wife and I were coming back from Virginia on the train, and we were coming into the car, and I had a suitcase, my wife had a suitcase, and we were trying to put them up on the rack. Well, I let my wife walk ahead of me, and I told her, just leave the case there. When the gentleman saw that my wife could not pick up the suitcase, he took the suitcase, put it in the top, and said, thank you. Then he said, can I help you with yours? And I said, no, just a stranger walking somewhere. And I decided, as we were walking down, I said, I'm going to buy him uh, a cup of coffee. It was morning, it was breakfast, we were catching the train back home. I went to him, I said, you know what? Let me buy you a cup of coffee, man. That really is a great spirit. Then I looked down what he was doing on his laptop, and he looked at me and said, well, I'm uh, just finishing my Sunday school lesson. And he said, as soon as I get that, he said, well, you know what? I'll go with you. He said, matter of fact, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. And we went walking. And I normally don't tell people right away that I'm a pastor because then people treat you kind of, you know, treat you differently. But it was something that we had such a kindred spirit. And as I walk with this gentleman, watch this. I still didn't tell him that I was a pastor, that I was a believer. You know, we just kind of kicked off. He began to just talk about God, talk about Christ. I was so thankful that on that train when I met him, it just eased the entire road, the entire ride. But let me tell you something else that happened. As he was about to get off, because he was getting off before we were, I handed him one of my cards, and he looked at me and said, man, I knew there was something about you. And I said, man, two believers can really, really support one another. Did you hear that? Maybe that's your problem. You never look to support someone else. If you ever got in your heart to support or love or pray for someone else, God could bless you. And that's why I said, I cease not to make mention of you. Paul realized leaders need prayer. Pray for your leaders. Everyone on this battle, on this journey needs prayer. Sometimes in your mind, you should just make a list one day and start praying for other people. Watch the burdens leave your life. Because that's how God designed. Then in verse 17, uh, he's getting into the need of the doctrine. Watch this. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Two powerful words. Wisdom, wisdom, biblical wisdom, and revelation. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember when Christ was on earth, although he's God, Although he was equal with God, he thought it not robbery to humble himself. He would always go away and in his uh, form of redeemer, in his form as a man, he always would go and say, I got to pray to my father. Now, Jesus is equal with God, but he humbled himself and praised God. I just gave you another thing we don't do to touch heaven. You got to sometimes humble yourself. Quit taking offense every time somebody says something to you. And quit getting to the point where nobody can say anything to you that, you 
You know, even if they're playing around, they're actually getting all sedity and holy and, and saying, who are you talking? You know what? You kill your blessings when you don't understand. Jesus Christ said, in order for this plan of redemption to work, I'm going to humble myself under my Father. And he humbled himself, and he was blessed with all kind of power. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, the Father of glory, the Father of glory. I love this. What is the glory of God? There's many times in the Bible people don't understand. They abuse the terminology glory of God. But the glory of God is all of his benefits, all of his qualities, all of his character traits, all of his isness, all of his splendor. When you talk about the glory of God, it's that thought that overtakes your mind and heart, that sends you to a place that you don't understand. We felt that glory when we first got saved. You remember when you first got telling people you were saved? You didn't know what that you were walking in? When you start glorifying, when you start saying, I'm saved, then look what the Lord did for me. Look what I did. You bring that glory of God back because what you're doing is lifting up His countenance. You're lifting up who God is. And when you lift up who God is and that glory comes, Psalms, uh, Psalms 19, 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. What is that saying? The heavens declare the glory of God. All I'm saying to you is that when you become a sign for God glory like the heavens are, whenever someone sees you, they're going to start seeing God's glory because every time you speak, you speak about His glory. You don't talk about my stuff and my car, my house, my things. You remember who it is that gave them to you. Anybody who's sitting in a position of where they know where I came from to where I am now can't help but glorify God. Every now and then you ought to take a glory break just to remind yourself so you don't know you so you know you're not out here all alone. Take a glory break and just tell yourself for the glory of God. Thank you God. And when you remember every little thing you got, give God credit. Every little thing you have, give God, give God credit. Every time you succeed, give God credit. You know, it's funny because uh, I'll get done ministering and somebody say, you sure did uh, a priest today or that was a good word. And in my heart, I just say, thank you. But uh, my wife has this habit. And not only her, there's another person out there. I can't think of it. And they say this every time. And it brings my mind back saying, yeah, God sure did use him. Yeah. And I started thinking about that. God used me. You know what? He can use anybody. You know what else? That means you don't need to just use me. So what we ought to do is thank God that in his own, when I begin to lift him up in his glory, that he decided to use me. And when that glory comes, I get blessed. I love it. The spirit of wisdom in Revelation. The spirit, you don't, don't miss this, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. What's that? The Holy Spirit brings wisdom and revelation. Not listening to other folk, not listening to worldly knowledge. It is the Holy Spirit that imparts wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is when you understand things through the eyes of the Bible, through God's eyes. Somebody said, well, that's earthly wisdom. Yeah, but that's not the kind of wisdom that will deliver you. Wisdom is when you understand what God is trying to say. When I get to the point that I have an aha moment, that's what God was trying to do. And when you realize, when you look back over your life, wow, that's what God brought me out of. Wisdom helps you not repeat the same thing over and over again. He said, the eyes of my understanding, he said, that I might have wisdom and revelation. And the revelation is that uh, divine knowledge from God. Revelation just means a revealing. It's a blessing that in the book of Amos, when God was actually chastising the children of Israel, Amos, who was a sheep holder from Tekoa, when he was actually uh, prophesying, or as a prophet, he was telling them how God was going to lead them into captivity and what God was going to do to them. But then in Amos 3 and 3, famous where he said, uh, but God will never do anything that he won't first reveal to his prophet. I like that. God reveals to his prophet what he's about to do. A lot of times we can't hear what God's about to do because in that moment we haven't lined ourselves up to receive that blessing.
blessing. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints. This is heavy. Let's read it again. The eyes of your understanding. Remember, the eyes is really talking about your heart. It is, it is where our real uh, the eyes of our understanding is the heart of our understanding. It is the place where uh, our real self dwells. It's, it's the eyes. It, it's a revealing to us of what God wants to say. That's why it says, may be enlightened that I may know what is the hope of his calling. Wow. That I understand God's hope for me. Do you know the hope of God's calling is everything you want even before you ask him for it. God already wants that for you. You're sitting around hoping for it, but it's calling, or that hope of this calling, of course, is for us to walk in Christ, bring other people to Christ. But what I'm saying is that hope of that calling is you don't have to sit around worrying about things and stuff. He feeds the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. What you worrying about? We sit around and hope for stuff when really if, we, if our eyes are open to the hope of his calling, once we reach the calling, everything else comes into place. Look what it says. It says that the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We got to pray that our mind's eye be open. Uh, it's talking about our mind, that our eyes understand what God is saying. How, how can I make this plain? Paul on the road to Damascus was going around killing Christians. Um, he had letters going above and beyond the kill Christians. And the reason he did that was because he thought he was doing what's right. Stop right there, preacher. That is how God blesses us because many of us have been caught in situations that we thought were right. But then our eyes were open to the devastation, to the danger, to what we were living in and what we were going through. God somehow enlightened our minds to let us see what was the hope of his call. You want to find what happened? Paul, in Acts chapter 9, talks about his journey on the road to Damascus. If you can remember, the bright light shone down. Paul was knocked from his horse. The rest of the men around him could not see what was going on. Paul fell down and he was blinded by the light. And then God showed up and said, Paul, Paul, his name was Saul. Then Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he told him, who art thou, Lord, that I persecute you? What? Who art thou, Lord? Listen, you were going around killing people who believed in Jesus Christ because you thought you were doing it for God. And Jesus Christ is God. But you thought you were doing the right thing until God said, you're persecuting me. And he said, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus, the one you persecute. Here's the kicker. He said, it's hard to kick against the pricks. What he's saying is, Paul was running all around trying to get happiness and joy. But in the stalls for horses in that day, they would have the horses so they would not kick and, you know, get wild while they were in their stalls against the wall were sharp metal pricks coming out. So every time the horse would jump and be disrespectful or, or kick or be mean, he'd kick on the pricks and that made the horse calm down. What God is saying is, it's hard for you to keep trying to live your life disobeying me. It's hard for you to keep kicking against the pricks and yet you want life. And yet you want peace. And yet you want to find life. But you keep knocking down everything in my word that tells you you can get life. And it's hard for you to keep going that direction because as Paul was doing, you'd be going around in circles and never really get satisfied. Paul took the letters because he thought he was still reaching for God, striving for God. But he didn't know he was going about it the wrong way until God opened his eyes and God said, and when Paul, for God to open our eyes, what he did to Paul, he blinded him. And sometimes for God to open our eyes, he's got to shut off every other way that we think is successful. He's got to put darkness in our way. Somebody just to me now might be running around not knowing where, you, where your life is, not knowing what direction your life is going. I always tell people when you see someone, even if they have star power, they have success, 
they have money, they have stuff. You ought to know that it does not mean that they have direction, that they really know where their life is. That's the kind of stuff that can destroy you or kill you. What am I talking about? Ken Griffey Jr., the baseball player, that's right, the Hall of Famer, you go check yourself. He has an article where he actually put, and he counted them, 200 pills in a bottle and just sat there and tried to commit suicide. He had money, he had fame, but he had no direction in his life. I tell you about Holly Berry, who actually stuck a rubber hose in the exhaust of her car after she broke up with David Justice or got divorced from David Justice. Her life was attached to other folk and she went downhill and she tried to kill herself. She just turned the car on, got in the garage, let the exhaust fumes come and she said the only thing stopped her, fact check this, she said, I thought about my mama and when she thought about her mom, she said, I can't do this. But what would make a person get so hopeless is when you're going around in circles trying to kick against the prick. You need your eyes open. Remember the two men on the road to the, of Emmaus? Come on, right after Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus came along, and they looked at Jesus and said, Man, are you the only one who don't know what's happening? Jesus said, What are you talking about? He already knew what was going on. And then he started at the prophets and expounded to them who he was. And then they said, Well, come stay with us and have a meal. And he sat down. And then that famous word that all of us say, they said, Didn't our hearts burn while he was in the way? And as soon as they saw it was Jesus, he disappeared from their midst. I believe God comes along opens our eyes right at the time that we can understand and once we follow he knows that we have found the hope of our calling. Look at verse 19 and 20. What is the hope of our calling, right? So we know what is the exceeding that word exceeding means more than greatness of his power to us who believe. God's great power, the very power which raised Jesus Christ from the dead and lifted him by the ascension back to the glory to take his seat on God's right hand. This is one of the most powerful texts there is because it talks about God's power. The hope of our calling is realizing our destiny in God. It's realizing we have riches in God. It's realizing that the power we have is more than we'll ever need but that exceeding greatness to us gives you the types of power God gives. You can write this down. What are the types of power the Bible is talking about? When we say power, we just say one word. But God has many words for power because power comes in many situations in our life. Let me give you the Greek and your Hebrew words for power so you understand how they fit into each situation so that you know God has given us power for every situation. The first one is dunamis. Dunamis power is where we get the word dynamite or dynamo. Dunamis power is the power that comes out of God. It's that Acts 1 and 8 power. You shall receive power. It's the power that breaks you out of a life of darkness. It's the power that drops the shackles off your legs. It's the power that, that tackles your life and breaks you free from darkness and any trial you go on. Like right now, you need some dunamis power. To give you a biblical example, Mark 5. You know the chapter of Mark 5 is a powerful chapter. Mark's gospel was always about Jesus doing things straightway and about the power of God. He was talking to the Greeks who understood who he was and Greeks understood power. So he wanted them to see there's nobody more, excuse me, the Romans, there's nobody stronger than than, than Christ. Nobody had more power than Christ. So he focused on the miracles of God. In that fifth chapter, we have the demonic of Gadara. We go down there, we have this woman. We first, before the woman came up, we had them coming with J.R.'s daughter who was dead. And then right on the heels of Jesus going to J.R.'s daughter, we find out that there's this woman with the issue of blood. And he spends time on telling us about this issue of blood. In the 30th verse of the fifth chapter, these words are said. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? The power we need for deliverance, the power we need to break through is that dunamis power. Somebody say dunamis. Then there is energia. It's where we get our word energizing. It's a Energizing force. You ever felt so bad and you were sitting around and you were just in a blah blah state or you had no more power to get through something? 
God's word can energize you. Energia is a powerful word because energia actually says it's a, it's a working power. It's the power that gives me the ability to pick myself up and keep going after I fall. It's greater than an energy bar. It's the energy to say, I'm going to try again. That will knock me down. I'm going to get up. I'm going to try again. I don't make it this time. I'm going to get up. I'm going to try again. My testimony is energized. My body is energized. My spirit is energized. Here's the verse, Philippians 2.13. 2.13 Philippians says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God working. That's that word energia. It is God energizing me so that I can continue going. You need to know this. There were some times you would have quit and God didn't energize you. Then it's kratos. It's the word for strength. It's the word that uh, can be translated into uh, a power that lifts. It's a it's a power that gets me uh, to a place where I'm no longer weak in my situation. You know, it sometimes we can be weak enough that we feel we can't make it. But God said, "I will give you Kratos power, so that you can make it." Kratos is Ephesians chapter six, verse ten, where it says, "Finally, my brethren." Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Now I'm going to use the same scripture again because it says power, kratos of his might, which is our next word, which is ishas. Ishas power. It means might. It is I-S-C-H-U-S. It carries with us that each one of us, once we focus on God's power, right, uh, and once we focus on the power that God has given us, we now have that might to make it. It's like I'm energized from the inner gate and now I have this power or this might that says I will not be defeated. And then finally, it's um, ecosia. That's spelled E-X-O-U-S-I-A. Ecosia is authority. I love God because power is no good without authority. So what he does, he gives us the authority, which means the right to do what we do. I have a right to live in peace. Claim your right. I have a right to have my resources. God so supply all my needs. I have the authority to speak forth this word because I'm a child of God. So whatever you're going through, don't sit there and let the enemy tell you you don't have a right. The reason you have a right is because God already covered you. Oh, when we get to chapter 2, you're going to see how deep this coverage is that God has given us. That you don't focus on your faults. Don't focus on your sins. Don't focus on your struggles. Focus on the fact that I have a right. And if you straighten up yourself and act on your rights, power will come because you, you don't even want to say I'm right. It's like, if I see my coat in your car and I walk up to you and say, hey man, let me get my coat out your car. I don't, I, I, then I go in the back and I get my coat out of your car because I have a right to that coat. And if you tell me no, I'm going to go get my coat out your car anyhow because it's my coat. What am I telling you? Is that you're letting the enemy take stuff for you because a door shut in your face or because it looks like you it looked like God said no. It looked like you weren't supposed to get it. But you got to say, wait a minute. I got a right to this. I got a right to have my body healed. I got a right to have my children blessed. I got a right to be able to walk around, uh, you know, and spend a good night's sleep and walk around during the day knowing that I'm enjoying my life. I have a right to enjoy that. You have a right to enjoy your life. Quit living a life so hard what God gave you and start enjoying the life God gave you. Matthew 7. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it said in that 28th and 29th verse, it said the people were astonished that he taught them not as the scribes and, and Pharisees did, but he taught them as one who had authority. Paul was letting us know that there's a power in us that cannot be, be taken lightly. I love the verse that says in Zechariah, uh, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And Jesus said in John 14, 12, Verily, 
the things that I do because you believe in me uh, and I go through the Father. Greater works shall you do. All God is saying is that because of the right he gave us and the power in us, John 14, 13, 14, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I give you. And verse 20 said, which he brought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So the same power that he gave Jesus, that resurrection power, is the resurrection power Jesus Christ gave to us, right? 21, where did he place Jesus? Now we get to the end of this. Far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. This, this, this chapter is just filled with reasons for you to not to be fearful. It's filled with reasons for you to say, I can live above whatever I'm in right now. It, it, it means that I'm going to lay hands on my children and change their destiny. I, I can lay hands on my body and change the doctor's diagnosis. you got to believe the mighty God. Somebody said, if you're getting spooky, I'm not getting spooky. I'm saying, if you're not a believer, how in the world could God take a power that picked you up out the gutter, turn your life around, make you not want things you used to want, and you think that same power, he can't do stuff physically when he works spiritually in your life that was beyond your understanding. God can still do that. Look what he said. He said, a far above all power, in every name that is named in this world and also that is to come. The name of Jesus. Philippians tells us, and there is a name above every name. Um, and that is the name of Jesus. So, I need you to understand as you finish out this text, it says, and place all things under his feet. And we are, uh, he is the head and the church is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. Guys, that's the blessing of this text. I want you to reread Philippians chapter 1. We're going to go into chapter 2 next week. And I'm going to probably do a round table with a couple of my pastors. So don't miss that. But we're going to go into chapter 2 and just kind of discuss what we have. Remember when you go through this text, everything I started talking about was um, gifts and power and blessings and heavenly places on earth. All I'm telling you is you have a right to live above where you are now. Come on, tell yourself, I'm going to go higher. I'm not going to stay like this. Tell yourself some good things are getting ready to happen in my life. Tell yourself, that I'm getting ready to be blessed above and beyond. I'm going to live this Ephesians life. I remember my power comes because I'm in Christ. As we close tonight, I, I, I solicit, I ask you, I thank you for uh, looking in and checking in on our ministry. I again ask you to go to our Facebook page, Shiloh Baptist Church, and if you look at um, it, our, our handle is SBC Praise Church. Now, you can't miss us up because it's all one word. Initials, SBC Praise Church, all one word. That's the hashtag for our YouTube that's the hashtag for our um, all, um, all of our sites. You can get to our website by shilohbaptistchurches.org. And just make the church as because we're one church in two locations. But if you want to go to YouTube, use SBC Praise Church. If you want to go to Facebook and like us there, it's just go to Shiloh Baptist Churches. Just make sure you look for Port Norris and Violet. A lot of Shilohs out there. But also, just look for my name. You'll see me there. And also, we ask you to go to the giving page. If you go on and look at the exciting things we're doing in this ministry, and if you're looking for a church home, you're looking for a church that's really giving and blessing God, then I would recommend Shiloh. Look, this is Pastor Duncan saying God bless you. See you. Go back and check out the rest of these teachings, and I'll see you next week. God bless.